Hey everybody, my name is Barry Johns. Welcome back to another edition of Studio Talk. I put out several videos out there related to interfaces, some from a budget level to the intermediate to semi-professional range. So today we're going to talk about what exactly, in this guy's opinion, makes a professional slash high-end interface. Let's get to it. Okay, okay, okay. So um, if you're finally at the stage that where you're looking to bump up uh, the quality of your interface, uh, the reliability of your interface, and so many other factors uh, beyond what you're using right now, and you want to dub into what some people call the professional slash um, high-end interface, well, we're going to talk about that today. Uh, if you're curious and you're looking for other videos, uh, about more budget slash uh, intermediate interfaces. I've got a couple of videos out there on those. You should go watch that. So this video is dedicated to what I'm going to call high-end uh, professional uh, recording interfaces. So, you know, there are some things that you get when you spend more money uh, on a high-end interface. Now, what I'm going to call high-end, that's anywhere in the 2,000-plus range uh, anywhere from 2000 on, on up. Now, I'm not going to be covering super, super high end, okay? Because I know that the vast majority of people watching this, those converters are likely to be out of the range probably forever for your project studio. That's a decision for you to make, but I think law of averages would probably stand behind that. And that would be things like Burl um, converters. Those are super high end. Um uh, Dangerous makes some super great high-end mastering um, um, converters. You've got Lynx makes the Hilo, uh, and, and as well as many, many others. Grace Design, there are so many super, super, I mean, just pristine interfaces, and I'm going to say are better suited for the mastering world rather than the day-to-day -day home project studio. So you're not going to hear me go into that level of interface today. I'm going to stick with the major players here. So who are, in this guy's opinion, the major players uh, historically and up to today for high-end interfaces? I think uh, Apogee certainly stands into that. You've got the Symphony range. Um, then after that, you've got Lynx. Their, uh, their Aurora N is out freaking standing. That's a great interface. You've got the Red series from Focusrite. Um, you have uh, some of the, the more expensive Universal Audio Apollos, be it the Apollo 8, 8 Pre, or Apollo 16. Uh, they certainly fall into that category, although those get, um, the perspective gets skewed somewhat on that because most people are buying that for the DSP. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those um, because that requires a different mindset. And I've got a lot of, video, a lot of videos out there about my perspective on U the state of UAD plugins today and whether that makes a sound investment or not. So I encourage you to go check that out. Nothing against UAD. I think they're a fantastic company and make great products. Okay. So I know I've not covered them all. You know, you've got the, uh, uh, the Orion 32. I don't want to forget about that one. That's another really, really great interface. Uh, and then of course you've got Avid interfaces historically have been very, very, very good. Um, so anyway, so th those are just some of the examples. Please don't flame me if I forgot a couple here or there. That's not the point of this video. The point of this video is if you're looking for these, what should you expect and what, where does the value come in uh, for spending that much money on an interface? Okay. The first thing I would say without a doubt is build quality. These interfaces have to be able to function effectively day in, day out, in a professional recording environment with heavy, heavy, heavy use. Uh, so I think the build quality has to be absolutely pristine. And that goes down from every little knob you turn to, to the contact points of anything that may be plugged in or out of the, of the interface. Uh, and, you know, all those things that has to be super, super, super high quality. Next, it's got to have... Um, if it has microphone preamps, they've got to be outstanding. They've got to be some best in class for interfaces. Now, 
I'll talk about, I've talked about my carbon multiple times here on the channel. And then ultimately what you get from that is, um, fantastic, 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 uh, microphone preamps. Uh, some of the best I've ever heard, quite frankly, on, on a recording interface. Typically most people are going out into external microphone preamps for many things, but I would actually, these would be my go-to for the majority of my drum tracks if I'm tracking drums. So, so you've got to have outstanding microphone preamps, you know, so this one's got it. Most of the others, when you get into the RME units that have, and I forgot RME before, but when you get into some of the RME units, uh, you know, they, those come from anywhere from two to four to, to 12 micro, or I'm sorry. Yeah. I think one goes up to 12. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's right. Um, but the microphone preamps they put on theirs are outstanding. A lot of the uh, Lynx Aurora, a lot of these high-end interfaces like the uh, Symphony series, a lot of other Avid uh, interfaces that are designed for HDX, those don't come with typically with microphone inputs. Um, and so because they assume that most po people don't need that. When you're getting into that level of interface, you're either connecting that directly to um, a desk, a, con a recording console that you have, and you're using the microphone preamps in that, or you're doing what most people do today, what I do today, and that is wire all those into the patch bay and have those automatically wired into the inputs and uh, of the uh, of the interface. Okay, so I think when you when you look at that, those are some of the things you've got to consider. Next up, super super important, clocking. The clocking has to be rock solid and stable to the point that if you need to use that interface as your master clock, you've got no problems whatsoever. Stability has a lot to do with effective clocking, okay? Especially when you start in to get into multiple uh, re uh, 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 digital type units, whether let's say, for example, I wanted to add another 16 channels of IO to this, I can do that via ADAT and then use that as my master clock so that the other units that I'm using are using that as a master and then they're slaving off of that. So uh, we've really got to really change some of these terminologies, I think. But, uh, but anyway, you follow what I'm saying. So clocking is super, super important. Back 15, 20 years ago, I actually had a big bin clock in the studio because um, the clocking wasn't as solid on interfaces back then as it is today. It was solid on the high end ones, lower end ones, not, not very good at all. So you want to get great, great, great clocking. Do not underestimate the value and the importance of high end clocking. Okay. Obviously one of the important aspects is conversion, analog to digital and digital to analog. Usually folks in this particular price range and level of interface are using a lot of hardware inserts in their DAW uh, to be able to connect all of their external hardware units, whether it's compressors, EQs, and the like. Okay, so to be able to do that, you need super great conversion because many times you're going to get analog to digital conversion on the way in. Then if you send a hardware insert out, then you've got digital analog going to the hardware unit, then the hardware unit output going back into the interface. Now you've got analog to digital again. You could be doing that multiple times on a particular track on a session. So I've got a video out there talking about conversion and does it really make that much of a difference in 2021? Now in that video, and I suggest you go watch that because I think it's an interesting topic, but in that particular video, I talk about the fact that conversion has gotten incredibly good in the last five years or so. I'm using a generic time frame there, but conversion has gotten very, very, very good. Um, to the point where a lot of low-end and mid-tier interfaces have very, very good conversion these days where you're not going to see a tremendous uh, sound quality going from, a, let's say, a $700 to a $1,400 interface. You're not going to see that dramatic increase like you would in the earlier days of recording with, with me and my experience, okay? So, so, but when you get into the super high-end, that, that is when things change. I mean, you're using some of the best uh, chips out there uh, to be able to do your conversion. Of course, the clocking, all of that comes into play. So you can expect and should expect to get the very best conversion um, 
uh, you know, up until the point do you get into mastering grade conversion. Um, so a lot of great players out in that field if that's something that you're looking for. Okay, next up we're going to talk about digital I.O. And you want to get an interface that has as much flexibility as that. So what are the options for digital I.O.? First up, you've got AES, which is a stereo uh, digital um, transfer of data from your interface to other devices, typically used in the video world, um, more in the video world than in the um, audio world. Next up is SPDIF. That's another two-channel, um, um, st uh, stereo two-channel in and out. Um, that's via a typical coaxial type cable, uh, not coaxial, but uh, RCA type connector uh, for that. And that is great. For example, you know, like for the longest time, my Kemper down there that you can't see in the frame uh, has SPDIF out. And I would go SPDIF in and out of that into my previous interface. Now, the carbon doesn't have it. And that absolutely drives me nuts. And I really miss SPDIF because now I'm having to go, I'm having to go digital to analog out of the Kemper into analog to digital into that. And it's just unnecessary conversion. So, but you know, the ability to have those things. Now, the most common thing that folks use out there are ADAT and that's usually used to expand IO and in other words, additional mic preamps and everything beyond that. And so uh, a, a high end interface, a professional interface is going to come with two sets of those to where you can do, an additional 16 channels of IO at 44.1 or 48. Uh, that gets cut in half when you go at 96 and above. So, but uh, I think 44.1 or 48 is fine for the vast majority of people out there, but that's your decision to make. I'm a 44.1 guy for life for my audio and 48, of course, for my video, but that's my take on it. You probably have a different perspective on it um, that I'm probably not going to agree with, but anyway, we'll agree to disagree. All right. So, you want to have the ability to get that in and out of there. Now, most most um, mid-level interfaces do have ADAT and do have SPDIF. Uh, very few of them have AES because it's not a type of interface where you would, uh, you know, want to interconnect that with high-end uh, video type gear. And then, so, you know, they do have ADAT, but most of them only have one set of ADAT. Or if they do have more than two sets of ADAT, you know, the clocking and the drivers and stability are iffy in, in some of those. So, Again, with these higher, more professional and these more expensive interfaces, you're getting stability, stability, stability. So let's talk about stability, which is the most important aspect of a professional or high-end interface. And that is the time and dedication to whatever company is making that particular interface that they put into writing and keeping their drivers updated with both Windows and Mac OS. If they service both, if they happen to only be a Mac type uh, interface, there are some out there that that is the case, uh, then they're always working on keeping those drivers up to date and they're rock solid. You know, you're just likely to almost never see those little warnings that pop up in your DAW uh, or hear uh, various type clocking issues or various type um, digital uh, noise that happens from from these things from time to time. You're just not likely to ever experience that. If you do, it's probably in the very beginning of the launch of that unit that quickly gets worked out. You can know and trust that when you buy interfaces at that level, they're going to be supported in a way that more mid-level or entry-level interfaces are. You know, perfect example, that would be Focusrite, who has an incredible history of supporting and keeping their, their systems rock solid in the red units, those are the high-end units, uh, but then maybe not so great of a reputation keeping like the Scarlet and the Claret and some of those, maybe keeping those as rock solid. I'm hearing that it's gotten a lot better in the last year or so, but they've had their history. Another manufacturer of audio interfaces that have, that have a history of having a lot of driver-related issues um, is going to be um, um, Synergy. Um, now, I hear they're getting better, but I don't have the first firsthand experience to say they're getting better. But if you read if you read a lot of what's going on out in there in the various forums that talk about it, they have they've historically had a lot of problems with drivers. You've got Universal Audio. Um, they struggle big time keeping their Windows drivers up to date. They do a good job keeping their Mac, but their Windows, they struggle to this day. Um, so you've got a lot of manufacturers out there that 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 don't do as good a job as you would hope 
keeping everything working and drivers updated and firmware updated and all the things that are required to be able to, to use this stuff and be able to rely on it because there's nothing worse than having, you know, interface issues, clocking issues, any of that stuff when you, when time is money. Okay. And so that the type of thing, that's the type of thing you're getting with a high end slash professional recording interface. It's going to cost you over 2000 and more likely into the $4,000 range. You know, most of them like this one here, it's $4,000. You know, the one I, that I wished I'd bought and I may sell this one and go to that one, but you can't ever get it anymore because it's in such high demand. And that's the Focusrite um, Red uh, 16 line. And because I don't really need the mic preamps that are on this, I really just need the analog hardware, analog I.O., you know, on the back of it. And with that unit, it gives me that. Plus, on that particular unit, it has um, 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 DigiLink connector. So if I wanted to use it with HDX or HD native, which I'm not likely to anymore, um, then it's also got Thunderbolt, uh, the most recent, not, I think it's Thunderbolt 3, Thunderbolt 3 on that, as well as Ethernet via, uh, I'm pretty sure they use uh, Dante. Um, uh, Motu and RME, I think they use AVB as well as Avid, okay? So, so there's a lot to consider here. So for some of you that may want to just say, uh, those interfaces, they're not worth the money. They're not worth all that money. You're not getting that much more for that level of interface. And quite honestly, if you're sitting at home and it's just your work that you're doing and you really don't see anything that you're going to ultimately create and produce to be something that's going to make you money, then I would agree. You don't need to really look at that. Now, if you've got the money and you just want the best of things, like a lot of people, then you do. But if you're in a situation, you're trying to promote your music, you're in a situation to where you're charging for your services you know, it's time to dig in the wallet and spend the money to get something that's a reliable because what you need in these settings is gear that never gets in your way. It never gets in your way. You just never, ever, ever have to think about it, which is one of the things that makes historically DSP type systems, whether it's, um, you know, DigiDesign TDM or Avid HDX or whether it's a DSP on the Apollo units, you know, what you get with that is the ability to record and track and just never, ever, ever have to think about buffer, latency, reliability, any of those things. It just gives it to you, okay? And so today, again, I've got a couple other videos talking about my thoughts on more modern day computers. And when I say modern day, in the last year, uh, to, came out in 2020 and coming out now in 2022, whether that's... Um, you know, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max or the, just the M1. I've got a lot of videos out there about that, as well as the new Ryzen 9. And then you've got Intel just came out with their new version of the i9 that is supposedly as fast as the M1 Max. So the future is really, really bright, okay? Super, super bright, um, where we don't need that DSP anymore, in my opinion. So that ultimately can save a lot of us a lot of money over uh, our journey on this, okay? So... I got a whole lot of other videos out there. I encourage you to go watch them, check them out. Uh, tell me what you think. Please leave comments down below. Give me your opinions, your thoughts. I think maybe some of you thought you were going to come here and I was just going to go tell you which interface to buy. That's not what this is about, okay? Uh, I do have my personal impressions on that. And maybe at some point I'll make a video giving giving you my experiences with certain, le certain pieces of high-end gear and the pros and the cons of that gear, okay? But... But anyway, go back and check out a lot of videos. I've got a, I cover a lot, wide range of topics and everything, and this is more of a discussion-based channel. Um, and so here to give you things to consider when you're thinking about these things, whether or not you should spend money or not spend money, only you can decide that, but I can give you a philosophical way of looking at that, at least from my lens, from these set of eyes, okay? So in my experience, in my journey. So do me a favor, okay? Hit that like, subscribe, and that notification bell. Really does help me grow the channel. It's important. Um, so I ask that you please take the time to do it. It just takes you a second. So please go down in there and do that. I'd like to hit 10,000 by the end of January. That would be fantastic. Okay? So I'm very excited about that. So thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you found this informative. And I'll talk to you again really soon. Have a great day.